Please, we have very few soldiers here. Kenneth, this voiceover officially makes up for all the Dutch tilts in Thor 1. Ah! All right, stop! Saving your bro. We have a hope. And with that, Loki became an honorary Avenger for a few minutes. That's all you have to do, right? Pay forward an Iron Man quote. Any thoughts that the Hulk would be the answer are squashed in less than five minutes, quickly establishing that Thanos has no one single equal. Oh, Heimdall. 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 Yeah, it just, it doesn't work with mononyms. Time to bond it up, I guess. Also, that was the exact moment we knew this was gonna be a different kind of film. Yeah. We'll never be. Ooh, no response needed. Because what does it say about you if you can kill a god? No resurrections this time. And it was at this point that my lifelong buddy Alex turned to me and expressed that it was probably good we didn't bring his six-year-old as planned. But Thanos finally got to exact punishment on Loki after his failure in Avengers 1, and also let us know that said villain that kicked off the reason for the Avengers even existing is nothing compared to Thanos. Composer Alan Silvestri's ethereal space score. I'm into it. Thanos is coming. Who? All right, so let's talk about our protagonist intro. Oh, you thought Thanos was the antagonist? No, 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 no. He's the first character introduced by his underling, his face shrouded in darkness, teasing his reveal. Like a ragdoll, he picks up one of the strongest people we know in this universe and toys with the other strongest character in this universe just to see what he can do, ultimately knocking him unconscious. He murders a beloved character, has his quest set out before him, and is more or less the only thing anyone even talks about leading up to the title card. This is Thanos' movie. Hugging. Ooh, have to love the building sound of the ship creating an atmosphere of complete dread like it's part of the score throughout this masterful long take that really pulls you into Tony's perspective. There's your spidey sense. And I'll say I know you were all mad it wasn't mentioned in Homecoming, but you're all forgetting this scene from Civil War. Oh God, I need you to cause a distraction. Holy we're all gonna die! Cool headedness from the guy in the chair. What's matter with you kids? You've never seen a spaceship before? We can't all be watcher informants, Stan the Man. <laughs> Modesty. Hear me and rejoice. You are about to die at the hands of the children of Thanos. It says a lot about Thanos that Ebony Maw, one of the most powerful villains we've ever seen in the MCU, is basically Thanos' hype man. It's like a game to him, the way he repeats the same speech and how he silences Thor earlier so he doesn't ruin the atmosphere. Dude, you're embarrassing me in front of the wizards. <laughs> oh, Tony. What would we do without you? Yep, bleeding edge armor, now with no blood. Tony, you okay? How we doing, good man? Really, really good, really good. Honesty. Teamwork, with just a slight glance from Strange, I might add. Cloaky to the rescue. Uh, Mrs. Stark, I'm being beamed up. Don't pretend like Peter knows anything about Star Trek if he's just barely seen Empire. But as we've established, Star Trek is always a win. <laughs> Longer invited to my wedding. Saving a new buddy gets you some generosity. Too high up, you're running out of air. <gasps> yeah. That makes sense. Oxygen lessons, altitude lessons, icing problem lessons? Iron Spider. I'm going to. I was just starting to get over Jarvis and start liking Friday. It does take a little bit of Tony's God mode offline, though, which is needed. Yeah, you like that, don't you? Yeah, you know why this tone exists is something you recognize? Do ya? Rehire James Gunn. Don't care. Don't care. Watch IDAP's video if you need convincing. Rehire James Gunn. Don't care if it makes you look dumb. People will respect you for listening to your audience. Now that that's out of the way, yeah, Guardians. Gotta give the Russos credit for capturing the feel of the Guardians with color palette change and obviously a little rubber band man. Yeah. Also, space. No coordinates, just space. So, Guardians. Quick, no exposition storytelling. Gamora is softening up to Peter's ways even more than when we left her in volume two. All right, Guardians, don't forget, this might be dangerous, so let's put on our mean faces. <laughs> Groot, eye roll, and Mantis mean face. How the hell is this dude still alive? He is not a dude. You're a dude. This is a man. While I don't disagree, I feel I should remind you that Peter also survived some time in space. Just like a pirate had a baby with an angel. That's fair. I'm not 100% sure what Mantis is doing. <laughs> Wait, is she being a praying mantis? Whatever, but each guardian conveys their personality with how they respond to Thor. Peter, Rocket, and Drax have weapons drawn, Gamora is ready to draw hers, and Groot is just playing his game. It stabbed me in the eye, so I had to kill her. It's life that was not, I guess. Round and round. A little now classic Ragnarok Thor. You're imitating the god man. Oh, I'm not. <gasps> he just did it again. This is my voice. <laughs> Thank God for Chris Pratt. 
Where we have to go is Nibidalia. That's a made-up word. Who was made up? Ha! <laughs> Every time I hear that, it blows my mind for the first time again. So true. Love. Hey, just like in his picture. Yep. Oh man, that's a beautiful beard win and some beautiful hair. A beautiful nomad. Finally, some real teamwork in this team movie. And from the Rogue Avengers, OG plus Falcon. We don't want to kill you, but we will. You'll never get the chance again. Well... One way or another, the path that we're on leads to Thanos. Why did Gamora go with the team headed to nowhere knowing Thanos would be there? Well, because she knew he'd be there. He was going to get to her one way or another, and honestly, the alternative of Thanos using Quill to get to her was worse than just asking Quill to kill her. More love. Hi, Drax. <laughs> That's three comedic wins for Mantis. Just in case you're keeping track, Pom Clementiev. Drax does get half of that last one, though. Must have pulled Tobias right out of the shower. Magnificent! 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 Eight seconds, steals the scene. More Benicio in four, please. This is I in your daughter. Ooh, what a manipulative trick. It's either a messed up way of revealing to Gamora that she does actually care for him in some way, or how I see it, more of a cathartic experience for her. The release she'd feel knowing he can't hurt her anymore. Still, it develops his character beyond murdering Madman. There's a deleted flashback scene that actually nails this point home, but you have to remember that Gamora, right or wrong, was on his side for a long time. She was a bad guy, and before she could really reconcile what had actually happened to her, I'm sure she did grow to love the monster that raised her. Relationships, even oppressive, abusive, and sadistic ones are complex. So, murdering madman plus Stockholm Syndrome propagator. Alright, so, yeah. Anyone with a functional brain knows Thanos is just messing with them, but would he be sadistic enough to let Peter kill her just for the torture fun of it all? Maybe? When did Ross get Bizarro Jason Statham on his team? Oh, by golly, it's one of the writers, Stephen McFeely. Earth just lost your best defender. Man, that'll get you right in the gut. Steve never stopped loving his buddy Tony. And predominantly, I'd say Tony is Earth's best defender. Except for that time he almost got Pepper killed. Oh, and created that robot that tried to extinct the world. Or brought a teenager to a superhero fight. Or created the Mandarin. Or tried to kill Cap. Wait, what was I saying? You guys really look like crap. I'm sorry, have you seen Cap's hair and beard? And Nat's a blonde now. And who are you to talk with that busted sp- Oh, right, this is literally every person responsible. Too soon? This is awkward. I think you look great. Compliments, also flirting. There's an Ant-Man and a Spider-Man. Wasp and Mantis now, too. Technically, there was a yellow jacket for a bit, but I mean, you're in love with a Black Widow. I know somewhere. But who, Cap? The anticipation is killing me. How will we ever know? Turn that down. I want to know who... Oh... I like Black Panther music. I'm sure it's worse than this, but that looks like lidocaine feels when it's injected. I imagine Doc isn't feeling that numbing feeling after, though. Also, for the record, the Russos acknowledge the Marathon Man is its safe inspiration of the scene, and it totally took the wind out of my joke. Lame. Wow, you are seriously loyal piece of weird. Loyalty? Yeah, uh, speaking of loyalty... Loyalty! I'm here. What did you just say? <laughs> just noticing that the cloak is mirroring Tony's movements. Did you ever see this really old movie, Aliens? I mean, it's a little more alien resurrection than aliens, but you guys actually did a little more scientifically than Ripley. If the blood melts the glass, the hole would just get bigger and bigger, right? Also, last time I checked, Ripley wasn't Spider-Man. <laughs> Ebony Wilma having a rough day. Or should I call him Ebony Thaw? Or Ebony Raw? Shivery Ma? Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Um... I'm Spider-Man then. All names are made up, Peter. Okay, why is Strange's hair moving now? Say, Doc, you wouldn't happen to be moving your hair, would you? Not at the moment, no. Strange's hair is the key. Solved it. We can, that's it. We can all go home now. Thanks. No, I say we take the fight to him. Doctor, do you concur? Man, is that a catch me if you can reference? Deep cut if so. Just kidding, obviously. It's because they're both Sherlock. You're an Avenger now. Listen to that musical cue. Your planet was on the brink of collapse. I'm the one who stopped that. This scene does double duty of slowly helping us understand why Thanos thinks he needs to balance the universe, while also confirming that he himself is utterly deranged and unbalanced. I was a child when you took me. I saved you. Not in a get this man some help sort of way, but a so completely narcissistic, egotistical, and deluded that he's actually convinced himself that kidnapping someone from a world where he killed half the population is saving them. That's Hannibal-level brutal. And another genius manipulation by Thanos, since Gamora already feels responsible for Nebula's robot parts, since they were a result of Nebula losing fights to Gamora. Thanos is just a, 
the latest in a long line of bastards, and he'll be the latest to fill my vengeance fate. Wills it so? There's actually some truth in that, and you could argue had he gone for the head. Either way, love this. Thor balancing the line between Ragnarok Thor and guy who has lost everything and everyone. He gave you his eye. Nah, he gave me a hundred credits. I snuck into his room later that night and stole his eye. Rocket doing what Rocket do. I tell you, it's a good thing this side quest didn't have a casino. Giant Peter Dinklage is always a win. Well, it wouldn't be an Avengers movie if good guys didn't fight other good guys before they know they're on the same side. Honestly, what this does well is show us that the Guardians can actually hold their own when needed against the Avengers best. I'll do you one better. Why is Gamora? Tell me where the girl is, or I swear to you, I'm gonna this little Let's do it. Don't call us plucky. We don't know what it means. Where is the Soul Stone? You should do one better. Why is the Soul Stone? Favorite cameo in the MCU so far, though I was disappointed it's not Hugo Weaving. Still. Tears. They're not for him. Ooh. Learning that not only is he not going to fail, not only is he capable of love and that he loves you, which would be confusing enough, realizing that even as much as he loves you, he cares more about balance or whatever. Gamora wears it on her face expertly. Love is in quotes because for the purposes of the movie, sure, whatever, the stone recognizes that Thanos thinks he loves her. But abusing your forcefully adopted children their entire lives is not love no matter how much you admire their fighting style. And throwing someone off a cliff to serve your own purpose pretty much precludes the ability to love them, misguided or not. Gamora does say as much. No, this isn't love. And I think and hope that we all get that she's right. And narratively, it's still a nice contrast to Cap's one life is too many. One life cannot stand in the way of defeating him. But it should. We don't trade lives, Vision. But just so we're clear, this, this ain't love. This ain't love. This ain't love. This ain't love. And dude, that's brutal. And awful. Also, Julia wanted to turn it off after this happened. So mission accomplished, Russos. that blending of the Avengers theme with a touch of Black Panther's theme. More BFF hugging. Why didn't you just reprogram the synopsis to work collectively? Because we didn't think of it. To be fair, it was like three whole years ago. Hey, I just realized, Bucky and Falcon back together again. Even Thanos has got a gimmick now. Get this man a shield. They must not have heard him. He said shield. Buddy, you're in space. All you got is a rope and a <laughs> Hi, I'm Thor. Have we met? I'm the god of hammers. I mean thunder. More power, Robert. Some lines you just ding. Also, Chris Hemsworth's workout routine. That's literally it. I just like to point out that when Thor mentioned his hammer was forged in a dying star, I always thought it was more symbolic. But nope, actual star. Mbaku! That's right, sometimes characters get wins just for being on screen. They surrender? Not exactly. Optimism. Sometimes I forget that they can run like that, and it never ceases to put a smile on my face. More importantly, I love that the two leaders lead by example and are not only on the front lines, but in front of the front lines. It'll kill you. Only if I die. Yes. That's what killing you means. <laughs> I'll leave it to Tyrion to really clarify things for you. What was that about Chris Hemsworth's workout routine? I don't know, the logic of Thor being able to withstand a level of heat that's being used to melt indestructible metal that will be super duper magical and powerful after casting, but hey, he's a god. What do I know? Dude's committed to the cause. All right, that's awesome. A little ingenuity, a little self-sacrifice, and most importantly, Groot finally doing something other than being a punk teenager. Something that wasn't easy, something that matters, and ties us back into Empire one more time. <laughs> or to the rescue! Epic Avengers theme crashing in just as it seems all hope was lost. And that definitely looks like the Bifrost, the colors, the pattern symbol on the ground. That bodes well for the future. Eitri did say, In theory, it could even summon the Bifrost. <laughs> you guys are so screwed now! Ragnarok buddies! Where's Korg? Oh, right. <laughs> Just a little more yep. You're much more of a Thanos. Perceptivity? I take it the Ma's dead. Yeah, unless his last name is Skywalker. <laughs> that is some slick teamwork. And let's talk about how awesome this amount of teamwork is and the fact that they clearly went with Star-Lord's plan since he really is the planner in the MCU. They all work together utilizing each of their individual strengths, including comedic timing, to actually subdue and immobilize the Mad Titan. And the thing that is their undoing is unquestionably anti-teamwork. 
It's maybe not an appropriate reaction, but it's realistic. Logic, reason, the universe, that all gets pushed out when you deal with loss like this. And he's been through it these past few days. Committing to and then attempting to kill Gamora and then this. And it's not even the first time Peter has acted irrationally when he found something terrible like this out. And it sets up how perfectly each member of the Pseudo Avengers was to taking Thanos down. One weak link and it was all over. <laughs> okay, there are some cool villains. You know how I feel about Vader and Joker and Voldemort. But holy crap, Thanos just threw a moon at Iron Man. <laughs> yes, sweet callback to Guardians of the Galaxy 1. You okay? Notice you've copied my beard. Friendship. Okay. That was apparently ad libbed. I am Groot! I am Steve Rogers. <laughs> Politeness is only Steve Rogers can pull off. I know I've been laughing a lot, but man, this is like the seventh or eighth time and it's delivered so perfectly and so in character. She's on the field. Take it. Ooh, solid deception and a good plan from the black goons. Remember when she said this? Where's the other friend? You will pay for his life with yours. I agreed with the theory that Hulk was maybe a little scared of Thanos, but I get that he's done fighting for Bruce, and what that does is give Bruce an arc to fight for himself. I thought you were a formidable machine. Cap to the rescue! Resourcefulness. That's really gross. And yeah, for the record, she got ripped in half. Crazy that they throw that CGI in there even though it happens too fast for anyone to see at full speed. It's just us weirdos slowing stuff down that catch it. Yeah, Muppets. Sorry, I can't remember anybody's names. And Spidey just saving everybody, all his new friends. Okay, you'd think Strange would have learned not to send anyone into the mirror dimension after last time, but holy crap, did Thanos just punch through the mirror dimension? Like, he just shattered it. <laughs> that look on Thanos' face. Like, what is it? Oh, it's just butterflies. All that for a drop of blood. And this is what I was talking about feeling uneasy about Thanos. He's just unrelenting. Nothing Tony does even slows him down. Leading to... Snap, that's brutal. Gotta give Iron Man props for holding his own as long as he did. Yeah, my respects, Doc. Sincerity. Genuine sincerity that makes me respect him even more. I hope they remember you. Coolest hiding place ever. Did we just lose? Yeah, we're as surprised as you. It's not like it's your fault or anything. Okay, I quickly want to talk about how fantastic this finale is structured. Three separate but equally pivotal and almost equally as exciting battles going on. And it's always kept so clear because of the starkly different color palettes. Yellow, orange, and bright light make up the battle on Titan. Forging the hammer is blue, black, with dark grays. And then Wakanda is green and has its own epic scale with massive wide shots. And then by the end, they all converge with both Thor and Thanos coming to Wakanda. Badass bad guy. And this score, Alan Silvestri. The slow, quieting of anticipation and then a thunderous build. It's as if Thanos' mere entrance has an effect on the weather. It's all right. You could never hurt me. I just feel you. And Paul Bettany killing me per usual. This epic showdown, the one we've all been waiting for, is mostly muted to bring in the score and have it be primarily a quiet moment between two people who love each other collectively doing the most painful things they can imagine to each other in order to save the universe. Even the most powerful being in the universe is still moved by Cap's uppercut and he's able to hold open the gauntlet for a few seconds. And then Wanda starts pulling double duty, literally holding back five out of six Infinity Stones, which makes sense since her powers came from the Mind Gem, all while the score sneakily turns triumphant. No, there's no time at all. We knew it had to happen, we just saw him get the time stone. Doesn't make it any less heartbreaking. Chestbreaker! Stormstabber! I told you. You'd die for that. Also, Chris Hemsworth is always a win. You should have gone for the head. Snap. And now we get to the river. The flap was turning back time, the turn was the axe, the river is the snap. The silent ending, the subversion of expectation, the cliche dodge. An epic moment for tragic storytelling. It's heartbreaking, but somehow perfect and earned. No, no, no. Eh, just plant Stormbreaker, he'll be fine. Rocket's response is still gut-wrenching. The one snap victim that actually seems to welcome it, and why shouldn't she after all that? I don't feel so good. I don't want to go. I don't want to go, sir, please. Oh, man, that'll rip your guts right out. 
And if you're wondering why it takes a little longer, some combination of Spidey sense to know it's coming and how strong Spider-Man actually is to hold off because he's scared, which tears me apart, especially after this just happened like yesterday. You're an Avenger now. That look of excitement quickly squashed by the realization of what that actually means and the danger that they're about to encounter. Not to mention it coming from the closest thing he has to a father. And on the other side, Tony admitting his dream to Pepper about wanting children while in the back of his mind always feeling like he had a chance to be a father to Peter. To teach him, to love him, to protect him. This may feel like gratuitous emotional manipulation, but this is the culmination of Peter and Tony's story, where they both acknowledge each other's importance and the love they share even though they're both powerless to stop the inevitable. I just want to point out how insane it is that this trailer shot is post-snap. Oh God. Of course, Steve is going to fall back on the thing he knows and believes. Though, it's not lost on me that Loki's decree lost a lot of its sting. We will never be a god. I guess Thanos is going to farm after all. What? Direct quote from Julia the other night. She was mad. She was mad for a while. Mostly about Gamora. So mad that it took me a few hours to get her to admit that this was a great movie. What I really loved about her response is that throughout the movie she kept saying things like, this is dumb, he's unbeatable, it's not realistic that they can beat him, but obviously they are. Fun isn't something one considers when knowing a movie's ending while watching it with one's wife. But this does put a smile on my face. What? I don't care, it's 2018. The trailers are part of the movie going experience now. But ending on our hero enjoying that sun rising on a grateful universe was 100% absolutely perfect. You probably noticed I used this title card for the intro, and that's because, come on, soul crushing, just like this movie is. Well done. Disintegration censoring. Yep. That's like the icing on a cake I didn't want, but hot dang do I love it. You know who I envy? Kids. Yeah, it's a bit much. I mean, kids being born like right now. They're going to be able to watch the entirety of the MCU from beginning to end for the first time all right in a row. It'll take them months to get through it, but still, I can't wait for Jude to experience it. That said, I think one of this movie's biggest strengths is that you don't need to sit through dozens of hours of film if you just want to skip to the end. Obviously, I've seen them all, but I'm pretty confident you could easily follow along and enjoy yourself even if this was your first MCU movie. I don't know why you do that, but I'm sure it happened. They found a great balance between explaining the important pieces of the backstory while not retreading things we already know. None of the heroes get reintroduced, but each of their personalities comes through, mostly. And you still get a feel for what their part is in the larger story. Okay, how much for the arm? Oh, I'll get that up. Speaking of those characters, let's get this out of the way. Spoilers, I guess, if you're not following the marketing around the MCU, but obviously any characters with scheduled sequels are probably not dead dead. That in itself doesn't really bother me. Characters die and come back in comics all the time. My only complaint right now is that there's nothing slated to take place between Avengers 3 and 4. I'm really hoping Captain Marvel either jumps back and forth from the 90s or at least spends some time post-snap, beyond just the post credit stinger. Maybe there's a movie they haven't announced yet. Let us live in this forever changed world for just a little bit before you undo it. Maybe it's too difficult to pretend that half of all life in the universe is gone. I don't know. But heck, do smaller stories that lead up to Avengers 4 in meaningful ways. Doesn't look like that's happening, so I'm sure we'll at least have the first half of Avengers 4, if not more, to live in Thanos' grateful universe, hopefully with a solid gap between films. Beyond that, I have only the tiniest nitpicky complaints. If I had to stretch, sometimes the Wakanda battle gets a little chaotic and mind-numbing. The CGI redshirt villains, yes, the Black Order from the comics, who are never mentioned prior on screen, felt a tad out of place with the rest of the film. It's just a pretty serious movie. Thanos is a serious dude. The movie also occasionally struggles to mix that serious, dark, deadly, world-ending tone with the general comedic feeling of the established MCU. The Earth's mightiest heroes. Like Kevin Bacon? He may be on the team, I don't know, I haven't been there in a while. Either way, they ventured into new territory and still kept the upbeat, somewhat goofy tone of the Avengers we've come to enjoy. And that's it. Figurative gun to my head, a few character decisions annoyed me, and there were other tiny moments that felt a tad forced. Otherwise, I loved every second of this film. The Russos, together with screenwriters Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, gave us just enough of each character to feel satisfied but still want so much more. Captain America falls into so much more territory, as does Black Widow and a few others. But I believe there's a reason for it. I can't get into it too much without potentially spoiling stuff for those who just want to go along for the ride with these movies. I made a short companion video that talks about my theories and spoilers because I know you guys are curious what I think, and I'm curious what you guys think as well. Anyway, the combination of characters was flawless. They all played perfectly off each other. Groups are kept small enough that nothing ever gets too out of hand while still acknowledging who the key players are. I'm sure there were some people clamoring for more Wong or Mantis, but the majority got to see who they wanted. Even poor Heimdall got a moment to shine. Which reminds me, Idris Elba is still always a win. 
Something I really enjoyed is how crazy powered up Iron Man is with his nano suit. If you thought he was invincible before, you throw another moon at me, and I'm gonna lose it. There's almost nothing he can't do anymore. He's basically Green Lantern. I talk a little more about that in my theory video. Either way, I, I love it. I love the sonic guns and the magnetic boot clamp and the rocket fists and laser arm thingy. And anyone claiming Robert Downey Jr. phoned this performance in is wrong. I want to be mean, but I won't. That's just hater talk. He left it all in the field, every moment. He's a contender for, let's say, second MVP, but honestly, I couldn't make a decision between Downey, Evans, Hemsworth, Saldana, Olsen, Betney, Cumberbatch, Holland. Thor and Rocket had a great dynamic as well. They managed to make this quieter moment just as compelling as the action-filled ones. Hemsworth is a perfect example of blending serious with funny. You speak Groot? Yes, they told it on Asgard. It was an elective. Which, side note, the fact that Thor calls Groot tree since he actually speaks the language and hears more than just I am Groot. Oh, by the way, this is a friend of mine, Tree. Oh, man. But it's the comedic and absurd, everyone I know is dead, with genuine heartbreaking emotion, everyone I know is dead and I'm ready to fight. He guts me and then makes me laugh in the span of a few seconds. Well, he's never fought me. Yeah, he has. He's never fought me twice. Well, if I'm wrong, then what more could I lose? And that's not to say they don't get one of the most epic moments in the movie. Bring me Thanos! My theater clapped, though if I'm being honest, I still prefer Thor's entrance on the bridge in Ragnarok, but we've been with these characters for so long, I care about everything they say and feel. And as Thor for an example, I saw every loss he endured throughout this series. So when he Jeremy jams Stormbreaker into Thanos' chest, I'm right there with him, just as irrationally yelling, yeah, make that punk suffer! But let's talk about our MVP. Let's talk about how astounding his CGI is. How amazingly Josh Brolin's mocap comes through in every grimace, every pained look. He's a villain that's not out to get our heroes. In fact, he barely cares about them at all. He's on a mission that has nothing to do with them. I love me some Killmonger and OG Loki, but Thanos. You don't hate him. I mean, you, you do hate him, but he's just doing what he thinks is right after watching his world come crashing down. It doesn't really matter how faulty or evil his plan is because he makes you believe it, or at least believe that he believes it. He's not just mad at the world, he wants balance. This whole thing should be. And while he has a history of brutally murdering people, he wants to create that balance as quickly and painlessly as possible. Because of the divisiveness of this movie, I feel I should add the disclaimer that while I called him the hero, it was said tongue in cheek because even though he's the protagonist, he's a very bad, 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 bad man. One of the things that makes him so terrifying yet somehow endearing is a moment like this of unrivaled confidence. You have my respect, Stark. He's so good and knows he's so good that he can take a time out to praise an opponent. Not a typical thing for a supervillain to do. He's also understanding and has empathy to a point. Intentions don't redeem his actions, but we understand his motivations as flawed as his logic is. The zero-sum philosophy shouldn't really even come into play for what appears to be a space-faring civilization, but it's one real madman have used before. A complaint I've heard is why did he wait so long and then get all the stones in a matter of days? Well, I think the answer is in the question. He had to know once he started collecting them, the longer he took, the more likely he'd be stopped. He didn't want to start until all of them were attainable, and finally knowing the Soul Stone was in reach was his cue to begin. Another question is why not double the universe's resources? And that's because he's not a messiah. I didn't take it like he was trying to save the world, he's trying to fix it so that people will learn their lesson and do better next time. I'm not going to get into whether he's right or wrong, because he's just plain wrong. It's a, it's a bad plan. That wouldn't work, and he'd have to snap his fingers every couple decades. And yes, I've seen Matt Pat's video, it's cute but he glosses over a lot of unknowable variables like economical and infrastructural collapse and other even more vital issues that I'm not going to get into here because I don't really care. It's Thanos' resolve that I find intriguing. What did it cost? Everything. The most impressive thing accomplished was how evenly distributed screen time was with the breakneck pacing of the overall narrative. There are only the briefest of pauses, but the movie starts right away, to the point that Thanos starts with the Power Stone because there's not time to show how he got it from Xandar. You'd think in a two and a half hour movie there would be some drag, but nope. And then the narrative itself. Like I said in the beginning, Thanos is the protagonist. He's the one with the goal that he accomplishes and the one with the biggest loss. I didn't know quite how intentional that was until I listened to the audio commentary, but yeah, it's his story. It becomes clear when you consider that multiple characters were asked to sacrifice something they love and either failed or hesitated too long, and Thanos is the only one with the will to act on it. But let's talk about why this story is so amazing and unique. It's not just that the bad guy won, though well done on that, full stop. 
but it's that everything in the movie leads to the Avengers overcoming Thanos. Thor's last minute save with a weapon described as the Thanos killing kind was so well set up and then put on the back burner. And that's exactly how you structure a narrative where the good guys win at the last second. His return is set up perfectly to then still fail. And then they went for it, ended the movie with this universe at its lowest. The look on Cap's face says it all. They've been beaten here and there, but they've never lost on this scale. This movie isn't perfect and it's not necessarily a masterpiece. The Russo's best work? Yeah, probably. Best MCU film? Matter of preference, but maybe. It won't leave you warm and fuzzy like most, but it is an achievement that's never been even attempted on this scale, and it really shouldn't have worked. And yet every story weaves in and out of every other story, all tying back together and intertwining in logically sound ways. And permanently, Thor's hammer now forever has a Groot handle. They wrote a third act movie that has a self-contained story with three acts of its own. I'm sure you've heard variations of this type of phrase, so here's my addition to the conversation. In going through it scene by scene, I found myself stopping every few seconds during scenes to note what was happening. Like how Gamora says she hates the throne, so Thanos sits on the steps. Or just simply how you can go through and watch every time Thanos uses the gauntlet and realize the actions always correspond to a particular stone or multiple stones. It's very literally too much to list, but they did not mess around in this movie. So writing all that or just laughing and realizing 267 wins with just me laughing was probably not the best idea. Not to brag, but it's a laugh that's been called fake sounding by literally hundreds of people on here. So... I can Footloose the movie. Exactly like Footloose. Is it still the greatest movie in history? It never was. <laughs> <laughs> it means get lost, Squidward. <laughs> what exactly is it that they do? Kick names, take ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have a weird laugh. My Patreon supporters that see my scripts can attest that they usually come in on somewhere between 100 and 300 rows on a spreadsheet, whereas this movie was well over 500. The point of all that is how dense and meaningful and fun each sequence is. Each frame. Every character uses the best of their abilities or works together with another hero, generally one from a different franchise. That's why this movie is so loved. To the point that you guys actually pointed out stuff I left out, like the opening Marvel logo not having its typical triumphant score, or the amazing score during Gamora's death scene, or this line. Why was she up there all this time? And the Sherlock reference that I just couldn't see past Catch Me If You Can. And then the filmmakers crushed us and left us begging for more at the same time. I haven't been this satisfied by a villain's victory since, well, I, I guess I'd have to spoil other movies to say, so let's just say it's top three. You can't help but smile through the pain because they freaking did it. Beyond that, it's beautiful. Scratch that. It's absolutely stunning. Especially Vormir. It's epic. He turned another dimension into a black hole. He threw a moon and it didn't come off cheesy or unbelievable. Most importantly, it's fun. Not everyone is going to feel the way I do, but... It's, it's a moment in film for a lot of reasons. All right, I've been prattling enough. If you want to hear me prattle even more, I do have this theory, spoiler, further gushing video. Somehow, I still have more to say. Next week, know everything great about video, but I will be finishing that Lessons Animation Taught Us video. <laughs>